O Lord, deal not with us after our sins, nor reward us according to our wickednesses. O Lord, remember not our old sins, but have mercy upon us and that soon, for we are come to great misery. Help us, O God, of our salvation, for the glory of thy name, O Lord. O deliver us and be merciful unto our sins, for thy name's sake. The Lord be with you. And, and with thy spirit. The continuation of the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory be to thee, O Lord. At that time Jesus said unto his disciples, When ye fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou fastest, anoint thine head and wash thy face that thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Praise be to thee, O Christ. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> oh, I was, as I was, was coming up here yesterday, I was reflecting and thinking, you know, what, what can you say on the 39th Lent you're starting as a priest? Uh, you know, I mean, somewhere along the line, you think you pretty well covered it, you know. Even if you talk in different congregations, you sometimes wonder, are they listening at all? Uh, so I just, yeah, I just want to do some reflecting today upon how important this time is going to be, this period until uh, April 20th. This is our time. This is the time for sinners. And I'm kind of guessing you're one of them. This is not the time for the righteous. This is not the time for the holy or for those who think they've got it right finally uh, and, and can spout to you chapter and verse about canons and food and prostrations and what you should eat and what you should not eat. Honestly, I think many of those people are already lost unless they get a real repentance of heart. But this is the time for sinners. And it always comforts me when Jesus said, or when I read in the Bible that Jesus said, I have come not to bring righteous, the righteous, but sinners to repentance. While we were yet sinners, Christ, I mean, Paul says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And that's one of the reasons, frankly, why he spent so much time hanging out with people that others thought probably didn't belong to, to the kingdom, probably shouldn't be counted as part of Israel. 
Harden probably shouldn't uh, be people that a decent, upright rabbi should be talking to. And yet always he came for the sinners, and that means he came for you and for me. We enter in to this fast with a sincere heart, which we hope will result in change. Without trumpeting, without talking about what we're doing, because no one should know that except God and, if necessary, your confessor. Without, I love this one, comparing, you know, fasting rules, why well, I'm doing that. No one is supposed to know anything about this. Nothing. Nothing. Okay. It's between you and God. And like I said, if you need to talk to your priest about it, then you do that. But I mean, it's not, uh, you know. It indicates a lack, frankly, of a sincere heart if we get involved and, and do those things. Paul says the outward man is dying, but the inner man is being renewed. And that's the kind of change that we're looking for. We're not necessarily looking for better external circumstances. We're not necessarily looking for better pay. Now, those things are not bad. I'm not suggesting you shouldn't get them if you can, but I mean, that's not what we're doing in this particular period. We're not uh, focusing on how we can consume. I mean, those who call this a consumer society are dead right. I mean, we consume and consume and consume, don't even think about what we're doing. We're seeking that kind of inner change, inner transformation, which will truly allow us to be detached from all those things that we just love to have in our lives. A genuine sense of detachment. Not disgust, not condemnation, you know, I mean, I love a decent air conditioning system as much as the next man. But the fact is that you can look at these things and say, okay, this we have, this is good, but if it crashes tomorrow, I'm still in Christ. Just perspiring more. So a separation from our need for all of those external things which have come to mean so much for us. We should, during this time of Lent, be encouraging one another. It's often, I, you know, I said that you're not supposed to be talking to people about what you're doing, but I mean, if you have a problem, if you're struggling, if you really feel like you're kind of floundering on all of this, then yeah, you should talk to somebody. And you should talk to somebody within your family here. You should talk to me. The reason so many people's Lenten efforts tend to crash and burn. And not just if they're new at it. People who have been Orthodox 40 years can have their Lenten efforts crash and burn very easily, so don't feel bad about it. The reason for that is that we still try to go it alone. You know, we still kind of stand there and think, okay, it's me and the devil. Bring it on. And we get flattened. Very few of us have the kind of strength that it takes. I mean, when Anthony did that in the desert, the demons physically beat him up. You want that? No. So, I mean, you don't just go for it and see if you can survive on your own. And if you're having a struggle, you pick up your phone, you call someone and say, you know, this is really a, I'm really struggling with this thing here, you know, this, this, you know, I drove past one of these yesterday and went through the drive through, through just for the smell uh, kind of thing. Didn't order anything, but I, as I went through there, you know. Uh, that's okay for you to share with a brother or a sister so you can talk about that and you can seek their prayer and their support. All too often, we say we're being submissive to God, but in fact, even in our Lenten discipline, we're being submissive to our own will. To a will that says, I want to do this, I want to do that, I want to do it all. In many ways, we're a lot like Peter. That big floppy St. Bernard and apostle who would pee on the rug and lick your face, you know, and say, I'll never deny you, Lord. I'll be there to the very end. You can depend on me. Or don't say that, Lord. 
You know, you can't go up to Jerusalem. And even she says to say, get, get behind me, Satan. You know, we often, you know, play chicken with God. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And since by the end of the first or second week of Lent, that usually has failed completely. We reverse our narcissism and say, well, fine, I won't do anything then. I can't do this, I won't do anything. Rather than rationally and objectively looking at what you're trying to do during lunch in terms of fasting and praying and what have you, seeking counsel on it and saying, you know, maybe, just maybe I try to do too much. Yeah. Uh, we retreat into our egos and say, well, if I can't do what I want, I won't do anything at all. It's like we're five. But I know some five-year-olds would handle it better. I think I told you a couple years ago about the priest, uh, you know, that I had with mentoring out in, in Arkansas who called me just before Lent and said, I've been praying about this and this is what I want to do. I'm not going to eat. God must have weighed 250 pounds. I'm not going to eat anything until sundown. I'm going to celebrate Mass every day. I'm going to get up every midnight and say prayers. I'm going to do this, that, and the other thing. What do you think about that? It's not like he was discussing this, but what do you think about that? And I thought, that's wonderful. Yeah. I would suggest, however, that you go down to Target and get yourself a big piece of white pasteboard and a red marker. And you draw a big red circle in the center of that and smaller circles outside and wear it on yourself. Because you just set yourself up for attack. That priest is now divorced, suspended, uh, got some woman living with him. You know, I mean, his entire, that Lent, his entire life collapsed. Went to drug use, because he tried to play chicken with God. He didn't discuss what he wanted to do, he just announced, I'm doing this. So faithfully and rationally and consistently, find a Lenten discipline you can do. And once having done that, we can find other things and it will grow and deepen and you can get better at this. You know, it's a lot like athletics. You, know, you have to build up your endurance. Uh, you have to build up your strength. Renew the inner man. Renewing the inner man restores our original beauty. It cleans everything inside. Okay? I'm not talking about outward beauty. I'm not suggesting we should go for ugly either, but the point about Lent is that interiorly, with your fasting, with your praying, with your discipline, you're seeking to clear out, to clear your noose. I've talked to you about this before, the noose, that reasoning part of the soul, which is so darkened and polluted by sin that we cannot communicate with God. That gets clearer. I'm not going to tell you it's going to get completely clear by the end of Lent, but it will get clearer. And God will be better able to communicate to you. You will be better able to hear and to communicate with him. That's what transforming the inner man means when Paul writes that. And re recognize that in the Orthodox tradition, when we talk about fasting, we're talking about fasting not just from food, but from every kind of evil that is out there. Because you can fast with your actions as much as you can fast with your food. So you seek to cut yourself off from all of those things that darken your soul. Not just, you know, the triple cheeseburgers and that sort of thing. But all of those things that can darken our soul. The anger, the vengeance, sense of resentment, uh, you know, the emotions and passions we carry around with us all the time which, quite frankly, we enjoy. We really do enjoy them. And we carry these video, well, not to be, to be a tip now, we carry these DVDs around with us. Of all these delicious, delightful hurts that people have done to us, some real and some probably totally imagined. And the simple fact is we enjoy pay, playing the DVD. So we can go back and see at what they did to us and how totally justified we are in our response. How totally fine it is that we're responding this way because after all, look how deeply they hurt us. And then, of course, we come here and worship the one who when he would revile, revile not again. 
who accepted death upon the cross rather than fight. But the fact is we often deliciously remember the hurts and slights because it justifies the hurts and slights that we give to others. So you abstain from things such as despondency and idleness. You abstain from things like sluggishness and sloth, jealousy, strife, a malicious, malicious self-indulgence and self-will. And I am instructing you as your father in Christ from this moment forward, the only thing you want to do in the internet is send email. If you want to go on Facebook and check out Antilles doing in Iowa, that's probably okay. But go on no, zero, zip, blog and websites that have the word orthodox in them. The internet is probably one of the biggest instruments of disunity in Christ Church that exists. And I'm convinced those guys out in Silicon Valley must have had horns on when they were developing this thing. It is a simply an electronic form of gossip. And we go on and we view this stuff and we get confused and we get depressed and we get sluggish. The internet has just given a tremendous megaphone to thousands of idiots who up until now would have been confined to their own village. All of whom also seem to have had a large dose of grumpy mixed into the chrism before they were brought into the church. And many of whom seem absolutely convinced that they were brought into this church to explain to us how we should be doing it. And how the way I do it is wrong, or the way you do it is wrong, or the way in which they do it is the only right way. Do not look at them until after Easter. Hopefully you'll be weaned from the habit by then and won't ever look at them again. All of these things divert, distract, prevent us from praying, prevent us from reading scripture, prevent us from thinking, and therefore should not be done. Be watchful for the tricks that the evil one will pull out and try to snare us with during Lent. You know, there's a, a tagline in, I think it's one of the Vesper services in the Eastern Rite, during this period in which Adam says, the food that killed me was beautiful to behold and sweet to eat. He's referring, of course, to the fruit he took from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But inside that fruit, which was beautiful to behold and sweet to eat, what was there? Death. Death for him, death for creation, death for all of mankind. But Satan excels at presenting us with things that look good, feel good, taste good, and sound good, and yet ultimately lead us to a spiritual and emotional death. Remember, with Satan is the one who can appear, if he chooses to, as what? An angel of light. The evil one can appear as an angel of light. So can his, his, uh, so can his minions. So he attempts to distract us with delusions. He himself appears as an angel of light. He can take which that which seems bad and make it seem good. He can take that which tastes bitter and make it seem sweet. He can take that uh, which is ugly and make it seem beautiful. As a trick. As a delusion. As something which can lead you literally to self-destruction. I don't know if I've ever told you about the monk Homer, or hero. Hero was a monk back in the 4th or 5th century in some monastery somewhere in the Middle East. And Hero, you know, was a pretty good monk. You know, he, he was humble, he prayed, he fasted, he loved, he counseled, he consoled. And then one day, this being appeared to him as an angel. Now, if this ever happens to you, the one thing you're supposed to do is ask, who sent you? because they cannot lie to you. And if Satan sent them, they'll tell you. 
even if they're standing there looking like the Archangel Michael. Not having had a problem with too many angels appearing to me, it's not something I personally had to do, but uh, this is what you know, the saints who have had to do it tell us. So this, this angelic being appeared to Hero, and he says to him, God is very pleased with you. You are a good monk. You are a faithful monk. You are a disciplined monk. And he kept appearing to him and talking to him about this. And after a while, Hero began to believe it. And he, the, the, the being said to him, God is so pleased with you, he wants to give you a proof of how pleased he is. So he has sent me to tell you that nothing can ever physically harm you. You need not fear death. And so Hero, to test this, went up on the walls of the monastery and threw himself off. He killed himself. And it was with great effort, the other monks who had seen what was going on and tried to talk to him about it, convinced the abbot that he should not be excluded from the cemetery as a suicide. There are canons that say that if you are under delusion, if you are distracted, that is the term they use, but if you're under delusion, if you're under demonic influence, then you can, you can have Christian burial, which is why my son was buried out of the church. But Hero himself never got it, even as he was lying, dying on the ground. He was convinced that what the angel, an angelic being, had told him was true. Well, the angel was a demon. The angel was a demon who had sent specifically to destroy this man and succeeded marvelously. Because, I mean, if an angel came to me, again, not something I've had to beat off particularly, but if an angel came to me and said, you know, you're really a good priest. I mean, you're faithful. You get stuck in airports. I mean, I mean, you do this, you do that. I'd probably like, if you came to me on a bad day, <laughs> I'd say, really? That's cool. Wow. Yeah, because I'm no more discerning than the next guy. That's the sort of thing you have to watch out for during Lent. Now, it's probably not going to be something deep like that. But remember that the angel is one tricky guy. And he will stoop at nothing, refrain from nothing, to try to entice you into evil. Three last things. Focus on your duties. You've got a da job, focus on it. Uh, in the monasteries, they say work with your hands, and some of you have the opportunity to do that. that that's good. It, it's, I find it very helpful. That's why I garden. It helps you focus. Uh, but whatever your job is, whether it's outside the home, inside the home, uh, whether it's taking care of the children or anything like focus on that and do it to the glory of God and do it well. That should be part of your life and effort. Bear one another's burdens. Paul says, bear one another's burdens, and so, so fulfill, fulfill the law of Christ. So be on the look during life for somebody who might be having a hard time and doesn't want to do it. <laughs> or somebody who needs some, some just, I mean, some support. I'm not suggesting you do an intervention or anything silly like that. Just, I mean, support them. Be with them. Tell them, you know, I'm praying for you this way. I know it's your first one. Uh, or I know you're fairly new at this, or it might be your 40th one, uh, but I, I'm with you on this. If you need to talk, talk, we'll get together, we'll pray, we'll study, we'll bear with one another's burdens. That's what it means to be a community. And if someone comes to you and does that, don't get all huffy about it and all offended. Oh, no, I'm doing fine. Why? What do you think? You know, you just accept whatever they say. If they're right, be grateful for it. If they're wrong, it comes from a pure heart. Don't worry about it. Just ignore it. You don't need to respond to it. And love one another. Love one another. That's what we're here for. We love him because he first loved us. But love one another. Support one another. Pray for one another. And so fulfill the law of Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, God is one. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. Let us pray.
and John Baptist and the council here in fall of all that time. We may be able to honor and honor salvation and may worship many of these people that have been saved and received God from heaven to save Christ our Lord. Amen. I bid your prayers on this first day of Lent for all of those who are attempting a holy and godly discipline. Uh, for all those who are traveling, especially through the winter storm, uh, for this congregation that Lent may deepen its devotion to our Lord Jesus and our lives in each other. Brethren, pray that this my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable unto God and the Father Almighty. May, may the, the Lord, Lord receive this sacrifice at thy hands to the praise and glory of his holy name, both to our benefit and that of all his holy church. Let us pray. Make us, we beseech thee, O Lord, duly and fitly off to offer these gifts by thy which we celebrate the institution of this adorable sacrament through Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord, who with thee in the unity of the Holy Spirit with us during this ever one God, world without him. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for the whole state of Christ's church. Almighty and ever living God, who by thy holy apostle hast taught us to make prayers and supplications and to give thanks for all men. We humbly beseech thee most mercifully to accept our alms and oblations, and to receive these our prayers which we offer unto thy divine majesty, beseeching thee to inspire continually <coughs> the universal church in the spirit of truth, unity, and concord, and grant that all those that confess thy holy name may agree in the truth of thy holy word, and live in unity and godly love. We beseech thee also so to direct and dispose the hearts of all Christian rulers, that they may truly and impartially administer justice for the punishment of wickedness and vice and for the maintenance of thy true religion and virtue. Give grace, O Heavenly Father, to all Orthodox bishops and other ministers, especially Ignatius, our patriarch, Philip, our metropolitan, John, our bishop, Anthony, our bishop, and to the Holy Synod, that they may both by their life and doctrine set forth thy true and lively word and rightly and duly administer thy holy sacrament. And to all thy people give thy heavenly grace, and especially to this congregation here present, that with meek heart and due reverence they may hear and receive thy holy word, <coughs> truly serving thee in holiness and righteousness all the days of their life. And we most humbly beseech thee of my goodness, O Lord, to comfort and succor all those who in this transitory life are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity especially all those whom we commemorate in our hearts at this time. And we also bless thy holy name for all thy service.